Okay. Becky, where are you from? What are you doing? Severeville, Tennessee, and I'm skydiving for my very first time. Why are you doing that? Anything because my boss is making me. <laughs> Joel Bruce. Are you ready, buddy? I think so. Are you nervous or no? Not yet. Not yet? I love you all, and my daughter knows where my life insurance policy That's is right. at. That was awesome. Tell me, I what can't did you even think talk. about skydiving? It was fun. Yeah. I am so out of breath. You're out of breath. We are on the ground. We jump, we landing, we survive. What do you think about that? That was awesome. I'm still shaking when I thought. <laughs> me too. Thank you. Thank you. Do me a favor, Sevierville, give it up for Greensboro on this Sunday morning, this last Sunday of July. Both campuses, everybody do me a favor, stand up, find about three people you didn't come with and tell them how good it is to be in church on this Sunday. You guys can be seated. You look great. Let me look around. Look at all the way above average people in the room. Lock eyes with somebody you didn't come with. Can you do that? Just look at them and just whisper, you are awesome. You're like, that's creepy. I get that. Guys, thanks for hanging out with us today. You had a lot of choices. You could be doing a lot of different things, but you decided to come to church. What a great, wise choice that is. So grateful. If you have your Bibles, open it to Genesis chapter 2, Romans chapter 5 to start. We're going to kind of be all over Scripture today as we close down this series called The Bucket List. It's been a great summer. Uh, it's been a long summer, 10 weeks in a series. We typically don't do series 10 weeks because we have very short attention spans, right? Squirrel! All right, so... Um, but most of the time, if you've been around the church any length of time, especially for a long series, I'll, I'll, I'll use this week and recap the entire series. I'm not doing that. We're going to close down with an encouraging word, even though you're probably not going to think it's so encouraging in just a minute. You're going to be like, why did I even come today? I should have stayed home today. I can't believe we're talking about what we're talking about today. But we need to talk about it to close this bucket list series down. If, I'll, I'll reiterate what Tracy said. If you missed a few weeks, a lot of us have been on vacation, plugging in and plugging out of church this summer. Go back and watch some of these messages. Really, the whole series, it'll come on the screen. We brought it to three sentences, right? Live life intentionally, identify what's important, and invest in God's kingdom. That's what we've been talking about all summer, really encouraging each other in a world that seems to be like we don't want to tackle, we want, don't want to deal uh, maybe with certain things, we tend to stay in our bubbles, but yet we don't want to also live a life with what if I would have. So this bucket list idea really was from the movie. I'd never seen the movie before. I told you that week one, the bucket list, a long time ago, Morgan Freeman, Jack Nicholson. The reason I didn't see the movie is I don't like Jack Nicholson. I don't think he's a great actor. Some of you will get mad at me when I say that. 
You're mad at the preacher because I told you Jack Nicholson's not a great actor. Um, but I love Morgan Freeman. I just think every movie that Jack Nicholson's in is exactly the same. So some of you are already mad. Who loves Jack Nicholson? Okay, the problem is you can't handle the truth. So, <laughs> oh, that was, that was good. But I'd never seen the movie before, and we kicked this idea around the bucket list. Instead of uh, just really, instead of just living our life in the what ifs, we need to get outside our comfort zone. We need to do that. Everybody's all about the bucket list. How many of you would say, and this is pretty intriguing as I talk to a lot of people this summer, how many of you say that there are some bucket list items that you want to do in your life that you kind of haven't done yet and you think about it all the time? Let's see some hands. Maybe traveling. Last week, we took a safari to Bybee, Tennessee. If you missed last week, go back and watch it. I, I fibbed up front in the message. Some of you were so mad. I can't believe the preacher would go on a safari to Africa and then say it was for me. But safari was a huge one. This week, number one, when I ask you in April, what's a bucket list item that you want to do? Skydiving was probably the most written down thing out of a stack of this many communication cards. Maybe it's just easy. It's a default thing. We've seen, we've seen the movie, Bucket List, those older guys skydived. Maybe some of you uh, would never want to skydive. Uh, who has ever been skydiving before? Let's see some hands. Wow. Stand up if you've been skydiving. Let's see the adventuresome people among us. Look at that. So pretty awesome. Uh, you guys can be seated. Love it. You guys are super uh, taste death, live life. Woo, right? How many of you are like, Brent, I would never jump out of a plane. Let's see some hands. You're like, never, ever, 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 ever. So we were sitting at creative meeting. This was right before the series. We were trying to finish the last few weeks. And when I looked at the communication cards and skydiving was right up there on the list, I scanned the room and I said to myself, who is going to jump out of a plane and we're going to video it. And I thought, number one, not me. How about that? I don't, I just, I'll do crazy things. I, I, I will skydive one day, I guess, but no reason jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. God invented airplanes for a reason. And I just think that. So I thought to myself, who would do this to bring the biggest impact? And I stopped at grandma, Becky. And I said, Becky, you're going to jump out of an airplane. And I thought she would go, no, I'm not. You know, I thought she would really, that doesn't sound like Becky. I'm just over dr drama there. Um, and she goes, I'll do it. And I'm like, all right, cool. You can't go alone. Joel, how about you? Joel's like, well, yeah. Well, Jeanette, Joel's wife is sitting right next to him. No, he's not doing that. And that's when I'm like, oh, yes, he is. But Joel, he preempted it. He stuck his hand out to his wife and said, talk to the hand. I'll do what I want to do. <laughs> did, did you say that, Joel? Joel didn't say that. <laughs> what did Joel say? Honey, is it okay if I... Je Jeanette's like, fine, it's for the church. I doubt you're going to die for Jesus. <laughs> so they went. Becky jumped out of a plane. <sighs> wow, what a moment. So I got back from vacation. They had went down to Chattanooga because that apparently is the safest place to jump out of a plane. There's places around here, but it's sketchy, they say. So they drove down to Chattanooga to do that. And so when I got back and I walked in my office, I was so excited to hear Becky's story because I knew she would be like, just, I can't believe you made me do that. It scared me. <laughs> I mean, I figured she would just go crazy. You know what she said? She goes, I would do it again. I loved it. I said, but you are a little chicken because you didn't tell your only daughter you were going to jump out of a plane before you did it. I thought that was wrong of you, Becky. <laughs> so this message, honestly, when we thought about skydiving, I thought, man, a profile and courage. I think we need a lot of courage today. The scripture, the Bible talks so much about being courageous in a world that whew, seems to be very fearful. And those things are apropos. We could preach on that. But then I thought about the movie, and I, I kind of went back and forth. I battled a little bit about this week in my heart and mind, and just as I prayed through it and I thought about what to say, I thought, well, wait a minute, we, we got to get to the point of the movie. We got to get to the point of a bucket list. The bucket list, especially battling the know what ifs of life, I'm not a good preacher, and I'm going to honestly 
do you a disservice if we don't think about the moral of the story. The point of the movie is what? It's not that these guys did all these adventuresome things in life. We all love those things. But they both died. Spoiler alert, Jack Nicholson's character and Morgan Freeman's character in the movie died. They were cremated, put in a coffee can, I think, put in a little box on top of a mountain somewhere. The end. So we can't kind of finish the series, The Bucket List, without talking about kicking the bucket. So we're going to talk about death today. I'll let that settle in. No. So here's the truth, right? Truth is like surgery. It hurts and then it heals. The truth is this, and it's important to know, our time on the earth is limited. What if you knew for sure that your time was limited? What if you knew for sure the day or the hour that you were going to die? What if I told you somehow, some way, that I could stand you on the platform and I could say, you know, I'll lay hands on you and say, listen, uh, September the 19th this year, you're going to die in a car accident. What if you knew for sure? First off, you'd be skeptical. You would be in denial. You would think uh, there's no way he knows. But what if you and I knew for sure? I have a feeling lots of things would be different. We might look at life as a blessing right now. We look at life as a bummer. Some of us are like, man, can this world get any crazier? Some of us would have to make a phone call to a few people that we need to make a phone call and we need to make amends. We would ask for forgiveness. We would reprioritize so many things. Well, that's really the moral of the idea of the bucket list. The idea of the bucket list is we want to do things in this one and only life before our life is over. And honestly, uh, one out of one of us die. So what if you knew? What would be different? So for me, we can tackle the what ifs. We don't want to stay in our bubbles. I get all those things. But as a pastor, I need to you to hear me out. You don't want to listen to this. I get it. It's going to be intense. It's going to be a little heavy. But what if you died today? Where would you spend tomorrow? What if? I love this quote. J.C. Ryle will come on the screen. I think it's true. Uh, All of life is uncertainty. Your life is sure all uncertainty. Your death and Your judgment, though, are perfectly sure. A lot of people would say, well, death is pretty uncertain. Don't know the afterlife. I know what a lot of people say, and I don't know. Maybe maybe that's not how I feel. I kind of feel like when I die, I'm just going to be nothing. Look at me. That is a, eternity is a long time for you and I to get that wrong. Eternity is a long time to listen to a culture, to listen to some, I don't know, Greek philosopher, Epicurus, that says, hey, when you're, when you're dead, you're not, right? People go, well, that's, I'm hoping that way so I can do what I want to in this one and only life, but eternity is a long time, and according to God's word, life is the uncertain thing. Your death, my death, and your judgment, my judgment is perfectly certain. So there's a lot to say, and if you have, you know, some things to write, um, something to write with, get it out. I just want to talk about it for a few minutes. Uh, We'll have a little bit of fun. People will say there's only two things certain in life, uh, death and taxes. That's kind of boring. We've heard that before, but there's a few things I'll add to that. Death and taxes may be inevitable, but they shouldn't be related. I really love that quote. I think that's interesting. You'll get that on the way home. And this is my favorite quote of the the week right here. The only difference between death and taxes is that debt doesn't get any worse every time Congress meets. I think that is, that's pretty awesome. But if you're a millionaire, if you're a millionaire in the room, raise your hand. Let's identify yourself. You won't do that. Um, Millionaires, let me tell you, people with a lot of money know how to shield themselves from taxes. That's the big talking point in the world that we live in. Everybody's got to pay their fair share. And millionaires, boy, they know how to get out of it. But us middle-class people, we get stuck with all the taxes. Can I get an amen on that, right? But here's what I know, right? Whether you're millionaire or pauper, red, yellow, black, white, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. Uh, Death is coming for us all. You're like, 
So there's some things we need to realize, some things we need to, to talk about. I, I believe, especially in the world that we live in, and I've preached it for so long, in funeral after funeral, I've done so many funerals the last two years, I think I'm close to 50 funerals that I've done in the last two years, which for our church, we're not an old church, we're not a young church. Um, a lot of times uh, people will say that the church kind of is the average age of the pastor. I'm getting older, 52. We're all getting older. Can I get an amen on that? With that song, time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the few. I mean, it seems we're getting older, but we're not so old of a church where we have like death all the time. It's very commonplace, but I, I know I've done about 20 or 30 funerals to one wedding in the last couple of years. So I think about death often, and I say this in funerals, that death is the forbidden subject of our society, which it is. We push death far away, which we do. The statistics still hold true today. Uh, it's very, it changed a lot in the last 100 years. Today, over 80%. Now it's bordering 85% of us will die in the hospital or nursing home. We don't, like, don't want to die in our homes. Years and years ago, no one wanted to die in a nursing home or a hospital. Everyone wanted to die at home. But now, as loved ones, we get a little freaked out by that. I know some people in our church that we've had elderly parents die in the home that they lived in, and people literally had to move out of that house because of what they thought, their, just their thought life, especially as a loved one would die in that home. We want to push death far away. It's interesting. A culture today wants to push death so far away. We will do everything to mitigate death. If we push death from our culture and our thoughts, what does that say about us? I do believe that says we are pushing God further from our hearts and minds and thoughts. We only think it's the here and now. We want to control every variable, but we live in a very uncertain place. You never know what a day holds. We have a lot of our online campus watching today from everywhere. We have several people watching from Kentucky today, right now. We got to be praying for the eastern part of Kentucky and flooding. And I thought to myself, and it, it meant we don't really think about it if it doesn't happen to us, but Javon and I were watching the news the other day and we watched so many of these little towns in eastern Kentucky that are flooded and people lost everything. And now the uh, death count is up over 25. I didn't hear it this morning. I don't know if it's gotten higher, but with everything that we've gone through, COVID and everything that's happening in a very unstable world, can you imagine having to go through that? People walking out, I lost everything. Families losing loved ones. It happened to me. I mean, my dad, six years ago, last Sunday, July the 25th, it's the first time that the anniversary of my dad's death fell back on a Sunday. I preached on Sunday morning. Before that, early at 5 a.m., I watched my family dog, Marlin, a little miniature Dotson, a, the dog of my children's childhood. I watched him have a heart attack on the bedroom floor of my, uh, just right there in my home. We watched the episode. We tried to call a vet, but what, what vet is open at 4.45 on a Sunday morning? And it was just, so, it happened so quickly. And uh, my dog passed away. I love, I am a Christian. I love my dog, right? And so we wrapped my dog up, we buried him in a shallow grave, and I came to preach at church, and then we were going home after church to dig the grave deeper and put um, our, our dog of 13 years in the ground, and that's the day my mom and dad showed up at my house, and dad fell and hit his head on the brick wall of my home. And after that, my mom didn't want to pull in the driveway of my house anymore. I've since moved. Because she's like, Brent, uh, if we're going to go out to eat, uh, I would rather just, let's just meet at a restaurant. Every time I pull into the driveway, because the episode happened right there on the right-hand side of my driveway, every time I pull, I see Dad on the ground, blood everywhere, and for all intents and purposes, he died. It's so whew, final. And death is something we don't want to talk about. We don't really have the right perspective of. We watch a movie, The Bucket List, and all we celebrate, right, is uh, all the things that we can do in life. But we kind of miss the point that, wait a minute, all of us are going to die, and we really need to tackle that what if first. What if we die today? And you're like, well, Brent, you're scaring me. But you never know what a day holds. 
So what do we need to know? What do we need to be reminded of to understand and accept this reality in our lives? And this is what I want to talk about for a few minutes. Not long because it's too heavy. Number one, and boy, we're going to get into it here for a minute. Death does not come from God. Some of you will be very upset. I've had some great email the last few week, uh, few days. We've had over 1,000, almost 1,100 people before today. So Wednesday night, I had some emails that I was trying to answer on Thursday. And if you have a question about what I'm going to say, please email me. There are no bad questions. We'll try our best to answer them. But honestly, we're all going to walk by faith. You're going to put your faith in what you want to put your faith in. I'm going to put my faith in what I'm going to want to put my faith in. I put my hope and my faith and my trust in God's word, in God's son, Jesus Christ. That's what I believe to be true. The things that I'm going to tell you here are really biblically based. I'm following God's word, the Bible. You're like, well, I don't know if I believe that. You get to make that call. We all do. We have a free choice. So we'll start with that. Number one, death does not come from God. Death is a result of our own choosing. Humanity, big picture now. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, the Lord God commanded man, Adam, right? You must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will, all of us together, say it, surely die. This is where death comes into humanity. Death is a result of Adam and Eve, their disobedience. You're like, well, I don't understand why God would have done that. God created man different than he created the animals. We have a choice. We are created in his image. If we don't have a choice, we can't choose, right? So there's right and there's wrong. There's obedience. There's disobedience. God created Adam and Eve, the first human beings to live forever. But because of a choice that they chose, sin and death came into humanity. Romans chapter 5, New Testament, verse 12, gives us the result of what took place. We can know this, right? Sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all of us have sin. We are sinners. We walk away from God's perfect will for our lives. Adam represents all of humanity. So death does not come from God. That was not his design. He created us with a free choice. Man sinned, and now sin, death, and disease entered into the world. Why do I say that? Because this means, and boy, I'll step in it here for a minute. This means when we lose a loved one, we cannot blame God for that loss. You're like, whew. Here's what we need to focus on. God is not willing that anyone should perish, but everyone have everlasting life. John 3, 16, God gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God loves us so much since that moment that Adam and Eve would disobey and sin would come into the world, that he would pursue us with a love that we simply do not fully understand. He loves us more than we love ourselves. He sent his only son to die on a cross to take away the penalty of that sin and death into our lives. Christ would rise again from the tomb to conquer the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Why do we not own that, celebrate that, surrender to that? How is that so controversial in a world that we as Christians, what do we believe and put our faith in? That yes, we are sinners. Yes, we see that we live in a world of sin, death, and disease. Yes, you never know what a day holds, but God loves us so much that he would pursue us with a love to make sure that when we die, we also will live for eternity. And that's a love that we do not deserve. How is that controversial? But it is. Why? Because we have a God-like complex in our world. The death of a loved one should not lead us away from God, but it should cause us to draw nearer to God. Whew. There's a lot of people in our church 
that are now in our community, that are no longer in our church, that sat in this church for years, but a love, the death of a loved one took place. They begin to blame God. We know so many people like that. How would a loving God allow all these things to happen in a crazy world? All of us have free choices. We can choose to lock in on God's love and say, Wait, wow, look what God has done for us. Death is not God's choosing for us. It came from man's own choice, but God has made a way where we might have life. Wednesday night, I got home and uh, an email hit my uh, hit, hit 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 my my uh, tablet, and it, somebody said this great question. I said Brent, I just didn't understand that point. That death does not come from God. That it's man's own choosing and. The idea of humanity, sin has entered into the world. And they wrote this, and it was a good question to ask. I thought God determines how long we live. A lot of people would say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. Uh, when my time is up, my time is up. Yes and no. It's all about the perspective here. God is omniscient. Say omniscient, everybody. What does that mean? He is all-knowing. Does God know how long we're going to live? Yes. But God does not determine when we are going to die. God does not say it's time for that infant to die or time for my dad to die. Uh, we live in a world of sin, death, and disease. Yes, God knows. But God also understands that we are spiritual beings in a physical body. That means we are going to live forever in either a place that he has ordained for us, a gift that we don't deserve, a place called heaven that is available to everyone, or you can face a Christless eternity in a place called hell. And that's where people once again go, well, I just don't believe that a loving God would send somebody to a place called hell. God does not do that. You and I make that call. You're like, I don't know if I believe that. Just look at me. At least be humble enough to hear this point here because eternity is a long time for you to get it wrong and just to listen to an opinion of somebody that they have no idea about the unknown. Do we have every answer to what eternity will look like? Of course not. We're all going to put our faith in something or someone. I'm choosing to put my faith in God's word. By the way, the more people stamp it out, the more God's word rises. The older God's word is, more, the more alive it becomes. We live in a time where God's word is alive. And if you just pay attention, especially to the heavens and the earth and the creation, to see that God created all things and he loves us so much, but we are his crowning creation, that we are made with a free choice, and we have chosen to live in this world of sin, death, and disease. Many of us will say, hey, with the choices that I've personally made, I've walked away from God's will for my life in my time. Yet God loves us. So that's one. It gets worse we are dependent people. When I think about the right perspective on death and kicking the bucket, to think about we are dependent people, boy, that flies in the face of our society today. We all feel like we're independent, but we know this, right? When we're born, we're dependent on parents. Can I get an amen from the parents? If we become sick, we get dependent on doctors and medicine. Can we give it up for our medical staff these days, everybody? We are dependent on the government. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta complete the sentence to keep us safe through our military. Yeah, yeah that's right, that's right. <laughs> gotta complete that sentence, right? We grow older, we become more and more dependent on our children. Boy, we don't like that. I want to show you something, and it's pretty interesting, I wanted to close with, because I thought about this lesson, this profile of courage, and I wanted Becky, the grandma, to jump out of an airplane, and I wanted to go back in time. There's a couple in our church. Her name is Teresa Kersmirnik. She is in a wheelchair. She has been confined to a wheelchair for uh, most of her life, and she uh, did something that you could put on a bucket list years ago. This was a VHS tape moment, so that shows you how far back it was. We have digitized it, and I wanted to show this to you because when it comes to a bucket list and getting out of our comfort zones and avoiding the what-ifs of life, what's our excuse? Watch this, and there's a really great spiritual application we can learn. With husband Richard at the end of the rope, Terry Casey is about to shimmy down a 45-foot cliff in her wheelchair. 
Carrie's been using a wheelchair for the past 19 years. And as you can see, she not only uses her wheelchair to get around, but down mountains. Yeah, a lot of people have said I'm crazy, but it's... I just figure you go around one time, you know, I'll do anything once. Terry got the idea of rappelling in her wheelchair from her Girl Scout troop. And now Terry's story is going global. Her name, face, and spirit are plastered on McDonald's cups and bags worldwide. Pretty cool. Teresa gave me this, by the way. You're like, I thought you said her name was Teresa. She went by Terry Casey. Well, her whole deal went a little global on a McDonald's bag, and they told her, don't use your real name on a McDonald's bag, so use a, a stage name. So Teresa was actually featured on a McDonald's bag, and that was not just regionally. That was all over the United States, um, really all over the world. And I thought about this, and I asked her permission to use this, this idea that, you know, yes, that's courageous. Yes, that's pretty awesome. What about, I mean, I've repelled. Who's repelled before? I love repelling. I think it's pretty interesting to go off that ledge and you've got a lot of trust. And, and I thought to myself, Teresa, that is, I don't know if I would do that if I was in a wheelchair. Seems scary. Seems unsafe. And then I thought to myself, well, if I'm repelling off a hundred foot cliff, does it matter that I'm in a wheelchair or you're in a wheelchair or not? If the rope breaks, it ain't going to matter. It actually might help. The wheelchair might stop the fall. And I looked at that picture of her, especially that one picture. I wish we would have uh, still shot at it, but we didn't. But you, that still, where she is literally hanging upside down. I'm like, whoa, what courage. And in my weird mind, I thought, she's putting a lot of trust in whoever's holding that rope. I don't know if it's a person that's their belayer. I think that's the right terminology or we've wrapped the rope around. I would rather wrap the rope around a tree. And I think to myself, and I, I said, Teresa, if it's okay, I want to use it this way. But I look at her in a wheelchair and, and, and she's going to symbolize our society. We live in a world that's broken and we're hanging on for dear life. We're trying to just keep our head above water. We're trying not to fall. We're trying to just make it through. We're trying to navigate life, our, our marriages, our kids. We're just trying to figure it out. And who are we putting our trust into? What does that rope represent? Is it our culture or is it Christ? That'll preach. For many of us, if we put our hopes in our spouses... Even though we might be married our entire lives, our spouse could die before us. I know, I, I will say it, I'm a dependent person. I am dependent on my wife. When she's not at home and she's not in that bed, she's five foot two. She don't take up a lot of space. But if she's not in that bed, I'm a basket case. Any guy in this room with me? Can I get an amen on that, right? It's Greensboro, anybody? I can't take it. Me and my dog, Cash, are in the bed. We're like huddling up together. Cash is looking at me. Where's mom? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I can't sleep. There's just something about it. And I think to myself, selfishly, man, I hope I die first. <laughs> and you're like, Brent, don't worry. You will. Right? I know. <laughs> but I'm thinking, to my, how could I live? So many of us, we have, we have spouses in the church right now. You might even be in, listening to me right now. You're like, Brenna, I, I'm struggling. We counsel people every day that have lost a spouse, and they are struggling. How do I live? Because, boy, all, all my trust was into that relationship. That relationship allowed me to keep hanging on. I love this passage of Scripture, Deuteronomy 33, 27. It's given me a lot of comfort. Maybe it will you as well. The eternal God is our refuge. Underneath are his everlasting arms. Yes, death, there comes a lot of pain and sorrow, but God can and will hold us up through our struggle. His arms will not weaken, and they are the arms who will hold you and I through eternity. 
The question in our society today, if you really dig down deep, is this. For us as Christians in a world that seems to be so many people walking away from faith is where will we place our dependence? God or man? That choice is going to be the difference between comfort and aid, agony and loss, especially when it comes to the death of a loved one. The next is, is this. I think it's number three. Death is, I'll give, you, I'll give us this, death is an enemy. It's an enemy. So many people are afraid. I had so many people last night walking out of church. Saturday night was awesome last night. Uh, just a great crowd, great spirit, a lot of engagement. Uh, a lot of young to old walked out, especially some younger guys walked out and said, Brent, that's me. I am scared half to death of dying. I'm scared of what that's going to look like and how that's going to come because, I mean, death, honestly, is the enemy of us all. I mean, the psalmist says it best. Talking about God's word, just articulating it how we feel, Psalm 55, 45. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Death, the experience of death is the ultimate un known. That's the truth. I grew up afraid of the dark. And as a young teenager, I grew up acutely afraid of death. I got saved at 15 years old, pretty late in life for a preacher's kid whose mom and dad were such great Christians, given their, gave their lives to ministry. I would have my, listen to my father week after week after week. As a pastor, he would talk about the reality of death. And for some reason, I stiff-armed my relationship with Christ. I just wanted to maybe just control my own destiny. But every night when the darkness hit me, I would be afraid of death. I've said it before. I'll say it again. It was probably mom's creepy prayer. My mom comes in, she's trying to be all Christian-y and pray those kids' prayers every night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I mean, that scared me to death. That was the creepiest prayer ever. Mom, check under the bed. Let's make sure there's no clowns underneath there. I mean, is this house clean or not? I mean, it scared me to death. That was a poltergeist reference, but... My mammal. If my mammal's not in heaven, none of us are going to heaven. I just promise you're like, well, Brent, everybody's mammals in heaven. No, my mammal was a saint. My papa died before my mammal. My mammal would have conversations with my mother about the sting of death, about when death would come, and she would live alone in her late 80s and early 90s in her home, and she would pace the floors at night. She would struggle to sleep because she would think about that idea of how, not death, not that afterlife. She was excited for that. When we all get to heaven, I'll fly away. Some of y'all love that song we opened with, I'll fly away. What a morbid song of the church. It's the weirdest thing ever. Last night, everybody popped up. Some glad morning when my life is over, I'll fly away. She, she was longing for heaven and eternity, but it was that great unknown of how death would take her. Many of us are there. So really, a picture does paint a thousand words. Let's go back to Becky for a moment because Becky had this... This moment, right, that she actually told me about. She's like, Brent, um, you're going to laugh because they, I watched the video in that moment when I was getting ready to get pushed out of the plane. Um, it looked like they were shoving a dead person out of the plane. <laughs> and I will give her that right there. That is a moment of terror. Can you see that? It's just, I mean, that is, you. I mean, I, I've never done it. I've been up in a small plane. The door has been open, but when that plane, that door opens at 10,000 feet and they're like, it's time for you to jump out of this perfectly good airplane. It's that moment. Now, when she jumped, did you see how happy she was? Whee! But that moment is like, oh. What I learned a long time ago in a passage of scripture that a lot of you probably know is this. Sometimes you have to reach beyond your fear, beyond your own understanding of what's about to come. And you have to understand that God loves us with a love that has been there since before we were born and will be there even after we die. 
Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39, for I am convinced that is, boy, talking about living life intentionally. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death is an enemy we all face, but God through Jesus Christ his Son is victorious. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Question. Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for the cross of Christ. The last one is this. Death is not the end. Death is not the end. A picture will come on the screen. I, I bring it up from time to time. My father uh, will have passed away six years ago this coming Wednesday. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. Dad lost his fight after hitting his head on the brick wall of my home. He was already very frail and feeble of health. I'm surprised he lasted 10 days, but he lasted 10 days. And on August the 3rd, 2016, he died. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. We were at UT Medical. He breathed his last breath. I saw his head really depress into the pillow. I've seen it happen a few times and it's really something that's pretty uncanny that when we are alive, there's still a life force, there's still strength, but when that last breath is exhaled from a body, it's, it's just eerie to see your head depress back into the pillow and know that you are no longer alive. Our family said goodbyes. Uh, my sister and I allowed our mother to stay an additional 20, 30 minutes. And then we're like, Mom, it's been a 10-day ordeal. You are tired. You are beat up. Uh, you need to go. My sister took Mom. My mom grabbed me and said, Brent, you are not going to leave your father's side until they come and get him. And, and actually, is going to get ready to take him. But you're not going to leave him alone in this, this hospital room. So I waited. 30 minutes, me and my dad, my hero, my dad who loved me. You say what you want about dad, but boy, he loved people and he loved me. He was my greatest encourager. And there was the lifeless form of my father. He was very surreal. I, I thought, wow. Whew. About four hours later, I would come to the church and I would preach that Wednesday night. It's all I could do to get through that message. Some of you were here. I don't know if I probably should have done that or not, but I knew that dad would want me to do that. And I thought about that in, the, in that hospital room by myself with my dad as I sat there and just sat next to his lifeless form. And I thought, dad, I know this to be true. You've taught it to me, but more than you teaching this to me, God's word speaks so loud. Uh, everything in my being screams this to be true, that death is not the end. But dad, I will see you again. The Bible speaks to that. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27, it says, just as man is destined to die once after to face judgment. Death is really the entrance into a new life. Honestly, though, this is what I'm after. Getting the right perspective on death is getting the right perspective on life. Coming to grips with death means coming to grips with God. Only those who are prepared to die are really prepared to live. The Bible says to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. To believe that Christ came to the earth, a baby, Emmanuel, God with skin on, he would live a life. He would show us what it looks like to love. He would die on a cross to take that penalty of sin and death. He would rise again to conquer the keys of death, hell, and the grave. For us to believe that God did that for us, to confess that we're dependent 
and that we need a savior to repent and walk away from what we know to be true and what we want to do in life for what we see the culture tells us and walk toward the cross. Even though we don't see everything clearly, with the free choice that we have in life, we are choosing to walk toward Christ. What does that look like to me? It means this. I am to get out of the driver's seat of the car of my life, that I'm directing, that I'm going to do what I want, when I want, where I want to do it. And even though I have no idea what I'm doing, I'm going to grab a hold of that wheel and I'm going to do everything I can. This is my life. Don't tell me how to live it. And I choose to get into the passenger seat of the car. God, you, through Jesus Christ, your son, guide me and direct me. You are God and I am not. With the choice that I have, I'm choosing to put my faith in you, not only in this life, but for eternity. And I want to receive a gift that I don't deserve, and that is the gift of salvation. I don't know why that message is so controversial, but that is the gospel. Hopefully, you have made the greatest decision that you will ever make in life is to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't put your head on your pillow before you do that today. Because what if today was your last? Let's close with communion. If you will uh, peel off that top layer and peel off that bottom layer here in our Greensboro family. If you're online this morning, I know Pastor Mike has directed you to grab something appropriate to take communion. Let's close and just be grateful for what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. Take the bread and break it. Eat it. Remember the body of Jesus Christ that was given for us all. That's how much God loves us. Take the juice and drink it. Remember the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us all. God, we are grateful for the cross of Christ. We are grateful for your love. Though one out of one of us die, you love us so much that you would give your only son to take the sting of death the consequences of sin and put it on you because you love creation, your creation so much. God, allow us to be grateful, to be thankful, to scream with our lives and lifestyles, hallelujah for the cross of Christ. And when we leave here, we get that right perspective on death that today could be our last. So we're gonna live a life to the fullest. You've given us life. Allow us to live life. It's awesome to to run down those bucket list items, but most importantly, to remember that all of us will die and we will face you. God, we're grateful that the cross of Jesus Christ gives us confidence to walk on each and every day. We never should run away from that. Celebrate that. Surrender to that. Thank you. Hallelujah for the cross of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.